question. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Max Tegmark. Uh, the other speakers, I know them for a long time, but Max, I only met recently. But he's famous, so he doesn't really need any introduction. <laughs> Yeah. The only thing I'll say, he's a physics professor and a cosmetologist and has written a lot about many things and is a founder of institutions thinking very high things. So, Max. <laughs> he called me a cosmetologist, which I'll take as a, as a compliment. I, sometimes I get called astrologer and that also. So, <laughs> so uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to see so many familiar faces, actually. Raise your hand if you're an MIT student. Awesome. Raise your hand if you're taking 802 electromagnetism right now. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, that's the course. That, that's the dedication. Even though they have to suffer through hearing me torture them with Maxwell's equations, they still come out on a Saturday. So I have this little smiley face here because this is a, even though this is a very depressing feeling subject, I want to try it with a very difficult task of injecting a little bit of optimism in it. First, by just pointing out that one of the, maybe the most important thing we've discovered through science is that our potential for the future of humanity is just much more awesome than we thought. We, was, we thought we were stuck on some little planet, and now we realize we're part of this grand cosmos, and we have the technology, and we're on the verge of developing. They can create a future vastly grander than we ever dreamt of. You know? So let's try to seize that opportunity and not blow it in some stupid way by nuking ourselves. <laughs> moreover, moreover, there is another very obvious source of optimism where the things are awfully, often are better than people often think. There's so many cool things you would love to do. Who would like to improve the MBTA here in Boston? Raise your hand. Yeah, but, oh, it's too expensive. We can't afford it. Well, guess what? There is, you know, because what are you going to cut? Are you going to cut health care? There is something we can save a lot of money on. We, we've heard a lot already about this trillion dollar upgrade. Well, Lucas Perry, I'm going to stand up for a sec. He, he's, he's a student here at BC. He's worked very hard making this little trillion dollar gift card shopping cart app. You can share it with your friends when we launch it this, later this month. And you can go in and you can click on upgrading the MBTA. Oops, one billion, still have 999 to spare. And, you can, and then you can maybe raise the salaries, of, give a $10,000 bonus maybe to everybody in the armed forces. Still a tiny fraction of the money. Maybe you want to build high-speed rail. Maybe you want to improve education. Maybe you want to, there's so much stuff you can do. And what you find when you play with this is a trillion dollars really goes a long way. <laughs> uh, continue on the, on the uplifting spirit. There's something I want to celebrate today. So today is the 88th birthday of the guy you see here who wrote the first ever really comprehensive article on the hydrogen bomb, the early hydrogen bomb testing and the problems that this caused. In, uh, he wrote this in, in 1954. And to celebrate this, we've published this this morning on our futureoflife.org website. It's fascinating reading. Feels very, very um, timely, actually. He wrote this article under the name Jules Laurent, which is a pseudonym, because he was worried about the McCarthy gang com coming after him. But I happen to know who it was. And guess where he did his PhD? MIT, right here, just a couple of years earlier in the math department, course two, in fact. And uh, one more little thing I can tell you about is, it's my dad. <laughs> Happy birthday, Daddy, Harold Shapiro, yeah. He, he's in the hospital right now, it's a kind of tough time for him, so I think uh, he's going to be very happy when I, when I tell him that uh, you all applauded for him. And if you read his article, and he'll be even happier. Now, uh, this was 1954. Two years later, these were all the American nuclear targets that we had. These were, this was recently declassified. With the Future of Life Institute, one of the things we're trying very hard to do is to make it easier to, for everybody to share this sort of information and, and really appreciate what it means. So if you tell someone, well, 1,000 or 14,000 nuclear weapons, what's that? It's a big number. But when you see a lot of dots like this on a map, to me, it has a whole different sort of connotation. And if you have a phone, which I know you all have, take it out, go to futureoflife.org, all one word. And uh, if you, if you, when you go there, you will be greeted by a website, which looks like this, coming soon to a screen near you. And if you just click uh, nuking who, 
you'll come to this, this thing and you'll find this. We've, we've spent a lot of time in the run-up to this conference to create a series of interactive apps. So you can go here and you can see, OK, let's look at my look at the, what was targeted exactly. Oh, surprising, China was targeted. China didn't have nukes then, but uh, apparently they were targeted anyway, and actually quite a bit. Let's see if we can find some big city here, maybe um, Shanghai yeah, or maybe Beijing. And then you can click on, you can zoom in a little bit. Let's go to take a closer look. Oh, Beijing has a lot of nuclear targets. Let's try this one. Um, actually, this looks like a little bit off center. Let's try maybe that one. And then you can click detonate if you're feeling a little bit morbid. And when you do that, you come to nuke map. Raise your hand if you know about nuke map. OK, Alex Wellerstein, you want to stand up? Uh, where are you? He made nuke map. Yeah. And, and then you can, uh, you can click, and you can see what happens. And, uh, and then you can try different sized bombs, and you can go anywhere else in the world. We, we basically want to make it easier for people to translate these abstract ideas into what, what it really means. And then you can ask yourself, of course, uh, how, how many nuclear weapons do we actually need to have really good deterrence? That was 1,000, roughly, you saw then. Now the US has about 7,000, including the, the ones that are slated for retirement. Uh, a lot of other countries have determined you need about 200. Some feel you need even less. Um, it's a good, very good, important conversation to have, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, my feeling is you don't need as many as 7,000. I think that's a pretty, a pretty hard to refute argument. Uh, now, other people, then there are people who say, well, OK, we have all these nukes, but why should we worry about them? I mean, no one in their right mind would, would start an all-out nuclear war. But we heard from Lisbeth that the, Maybe the greatest risk of, maybe the greatest military threat to the US is not a deliberate nuclear attack on us, but an accidental nuclear war. And raise, so I'm going to ask you a quiz question. It's a bad habit we professors have here. Who is more famous of these guys? <laughs> Let me ask you a second question. Which one of the, these two guys do we have to thank for the fact that we're all alive and well here because he single-handedly stopped the Soviet nuclear attack during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm giving you one hint. He's not Canadian, all right? <laughs> and again, you know, just to drive this home a little bit, we have um, made another app for that. Arielle Kahn, do you want to stand up? She, she's, she is our website, basically. This is Arielle, flew in from Colorado. Thank you. She, uh, if, if you come back to our main page here again, you, you, you go and click on um, on the near misses, there's a timeline of approximately 25 things. So we took stuff that was in Eric Schloss's book and from all the other sources and, and did a couple of things and, and just try to make it very easily accessible so you can share your, with your friends. And, and the, the bottom line is there isn't just one or two if three things. We heard we three specific examples from, from Lisbeth, which were very scary. Um, the Arkhipov one was pretty hair-raising because it happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis, with, which William Perry is very personally familiar with. And, um, but it goes on and on and on. And it, some of the things are even pretty recent. And it's, it's also quite obvious that there is a publication bias here, because most of these are from the US. I have no reason to think that this, the Soviet and Russian systems failed less and had fewer false alarm. And there's also a strong selection bias towards things long ago that have been declassified. So there's undoubtedly a lot more. And you all know, of course, that if you just keep rolling dice for a long, long, for a large number of times, eventually, you know, your luck does run out. We physics nerds know that if you take a, uh, it's just like you have a radioactive atom with a half-life. If the half, you know, every year maybe it's only one percent chance, but then look, the probability that you're going to go for a really long time without a nuclear war drops exponentially. So the question isn't if we're going to have an accidental nuclear war, but just how long it's going to take. So relying on luck not the greatest strategy. What do we do about this? What's our goal? It's been fascinating this morning to listen to the talks. It's clear that there is a wide range of opinions about, we, about what we should do, even within this room. There are some who feel strongly we should get rid of all nuclear weapons. There are some who feel we should simply reduce our arsenals. There are also people, especially people not in this room, who would instead like to increase our nuclear arsenals, <laughs> upgrade, and so on. So, but I think the really interesting point about this is it's not so. It's kind of a waste of time to argue enormously about the end goals, whether you want to end up there or there. If you all, we all agree that we want to go to the left on this. 
rather than closer to the cliff here. So the first step should obviously be less. For example, not spend a trillion dollars upgrading our arsenals. What can you do about that? You can do a lot of things. We have more power than we think. You have power not only when you vote and when you tweet and when you share with your friends some of the, all of these online tools and things that exist. You have power when you shop. If you're choosing between a Honeywell air conditioner and a General Electric air conditioner, you can factor in. You're free to factor in. It's a free country. The fact that General Electric decided to get out of the nuclear weapons business, Honeywell still in. Uh, um, and when you invest, you have a lot of power. Raise your hand if you have a retirement fund or any kind of mutual fund. Okay? Those of you who didn't, raise your hand. You have parents. They probably do. <laughs> uh, they have the right to change. Most people, even some very hardcore activists who would like to reduce their nuclear arsenals have confessed to me that they probably also are invested in, in nuclear weapons production. So we decided to, to make things a little bit easier for them. S Stephen Hawking, our physics colleague, he, good friend of ours, he, he wasn't able to come here today. It's very hard for him to travel, but he did send us a special message. He said, if you, don't want, if you want to slow the nuclear arms race, then put your money where your mouth is and don't bank on the bomb. So we're going to hear more specifics about that from Susie Snyder. But we, there's an app for that <laughs> as well. And I want to end my talk by just showing you that. You uh, can simply go back to the, the main page again and click on the, on the Stephen Hawking icon. And you get this little app. It works on your phone, too. We don't tell you what you should care about. You tell the app. You can say, I care about landmines, or I don't care about landmines. You just, Care about nukes. Whatever you, t you care about, it'll tell you, OK, here are the companies that make them. If you want to know, oh my goodness, well, that's weird. Why is, why is uh, Airbus on there? You click. It tells you. And, and then if you have mutual funds, may, it's kind of hard to tell whether your mutual fund, if it's an S Vanguard S&P 500 or whatever, is invested in nukes. Well, we make it easy for you. You go in here. Maybe you have TIA Cref. Maybe you're, you want to be socially responsible. Maybe you have money in the TA Craft Social Choice Ec Equity Fund. Oops, it got a sad face, a red face. <laughs> Why? Oh, they actually have investments in Floor and Jacobs Engineering, you know. And it's a free country. Nobody, can, you can't, don't have the right to say, I'm not going to pay taxes. That you have to do. But you have the right to invest in whatever you want. And if you don't want to invest in that fund, well, we have links to all the, the smiley-faced ones here, which you can, will, on average, give you just as much profit. And you can feel better about it. So in summary, yes, this is a very serious set of problems. But don't feel powerless and disempowered feeling that you have to wait and let, <laughs> just hope that Donald Trump is going to solve all your problems. <laughs> because actually, there is a lot of things you can do right now without even waiting for politicians. And we've given a whole bunch of examples here. We're going to hear a lot more later in the day. And there's even going to be some very exciting uh, announcements later in the afternoon about this. So thank you so, so much.